Today, we're on the Jason Ingberg podcast. So let's get into it. Your titles and thumbnails are ridiculously good, though. Oprah, she's wrong for this. I'm like, I need to know. I need to know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I actually have a video I'm going to be posting today with a similar title because you once you see that one thing works, you can kind of just like repeat it and like adjust it to another celebrity. Oh, if my Ellen DeGeneres video gets a million views, why don't I go and make one about Oprah and then Jimmy Fallon and then James Gordon? Everyone hates James Gordon. So it's gotten really nice to like find my niche within like the algorithm and this formula because it's made it easier to produce so much content. James is kind of cool. I met him once. He seemed really, mm. at least there's like that practiced ability. I think they say that Bill Clinton had it like the best, like off the charts where you just, there's nothing else in this person's world when they're talking to you besides you. Mm. And he had, he gave me that feeling of like, he was just so genuine. And like, I snuck onto his set right here at CBS. We were there. It's a pretty mediocre show with like Ryan Reynolds and Katie mm -hmm. Holmes as the guests. And then I snuck on to talk to him about it. Like, yeah. Hey, I want to write for your show. And he was like, he acted like it was normal that I did that. And like, he didn't have to do that. Well, now his show is gone for probably good reason, but I, I just like, I need to be nicer because I have too many enemies in the industry that, yeah, I'm sure he's fine. But I've just like, when I did the deep dive on him and finding these stories, like the restaurant owner in New York city who like posted about him and these like terrible things. I just can't imagine like treating someone like that. And it's that weird, like, ick I have inside of me for people who act entitled. Even people in the social media world or these TikTokers, because anyone can be a TikToker nowadays, everyone just acts like they've got this, like, power. And, like, yeah, he did, but he lost it. And I think those real, genuine people who are nice all the time or thankful for what they have, they will prevail, opposed to James Gordon, who's, like, not even really funny. So maybe he could have used you as a writer because that's what I he told was him. terrible. <laughs> I did tell him that. Uh, well, I said that I'd, I'd help this show, but, um, you are becoming like a powerful person. It's funny mm -hmm. because you're becoming the thing in a way that you you, you often take down. I mean, I'm not saying that you have any skeletons in the closet, but it's like obvious that like, it's, it's so ironic to me that the trajectory you're on, you have like a million YouTube subscribers and you're just beginning. Yeah, I mean, I know I'm not a perfect person, and that's why I've had my fair share of, like, apologies and things that I've misreported. What's nice about, I guess, my current situation is it's not very personal, so they don't really know about, like, what my day-to-day -day life is like. But it's uh, it's interesting having that, I guess, what somewhat of power. I like to say clout. Like, it's not, like, fame. It's not, like, because fame is something very different. It's just, like, internet clout is what I've got, like, really. But it is interesting to see these people who actually do have genuine influence become like scared of me or threatened by me or try to threaten me or my family. Nick Carter, Mike The Situation, Bob Saget, Drake Bell, um, Liz Gillis, TriStar Sports and Entertainment. There's just so many different, like way more powerful entities that for whatever reason feel threatened by my little YouTube videos. So I think sometimes in my mind, it's hard for me to wrap around, like wrap my mind around how it is influential and maybe that's why I get the ick by people who do know that they are the shit because I'm like, oh, I just don't feel that way. And I even like I'm filming my videos alone in my room. And even if they get hundreds of thousands of views, it just doesn't feel the only time it really feels like, I guess, that I have some type of power here is when people come up to me in public or um, just like randomly stopping me or yelling my name out of the car as they drive by just like weird situations because I'm like, oh, wow, like people are actually watching it because it's still hard for me. I don't read comments. I don't really. I mean, I look at the analytics, but I'm not like stuck on them. I'm when I post something, I'm just like, okay, what's next? What's tomorrow's video? Like, because if it doesn't do well, that's fine. I'll move on and make another one tomorrow. And if it does great, then I'll feel good that day and like have an awesome time. But yeah. Yeah. You work so hard. The prolificness, if that's a word is insane. What is it like a video a day now? Yeah. Right now we've gone down to, or gone to a video a day before I was doing like five a week because I was so stuck in the nine to five mindset from working and like consulting and um, stats and things like that. So when I like got into the YouTube world, I still kind of like stuck to the nine to five schedule. So I it was a hard time for me to like work on Saturdays and Sundays. And even now sometimes I'm like, Oh, do I want to, but it doesn't really take that long to like put together a thumbnail <clears throat> and a title. And once I like realize the reward I get for producing so much, it's like, why not produce more? And I think once you get your, th your, you know, 
process down, it's a lot easier. I see a lot of creators who post like once a week because they spend hours editing. And I look at every video as a product. Like I'm selling a product to my viewers and hopefully they enjoy it. And then I move on <clears> to the <throat> next one, but I don't want to spend too much time and energy that this product's going to cost me or it's not going to, or a lot of people are so focused on these like crazy edits. And it's like, that's not what people are looking for. At least for my content, they're looking for the story. So I don't need to do like crazy transitions or animation. And that's what I think a lot of other creators get lost in and why in a short time I've been able to create, you know, triple the content that some of these people who have been on here for years doing uh, are putting out. And it's just a lot of content, but I think that I've found like the perfect part of what I'm doing with this YouTube creation that um, I'm making the most of it opposed to other people who feel too personally attached to their content and then spend or waste too much time on one piece to get really little to no reward. It's so smart. I need to hear that. I really need yeah. to hear that today, especially like <clears throat> just emphasis on having friction, frictionless production where you're just constantly pumping it out. Yeah. And it's just um, even looking at it as I think, people feel so personally connected to their content and I get it because a lot of people come like talk about their own lives or things like that. But, um, when I speak to my agents and different agencies and partners, and I describe myself as essentially a product on YouTube or on the internet, then they love it. They eat it up because that's like what they want to hear. And that's, what's going to, if you look at it like that, it's kind of like running a business opposed to like dealing with your own personal identity. I just see a lot of people who get lost in that and insecure. And it's just like, I feel so disconnected from my content that um, even when people come up to me in public, it's hard for me to like almost talk about it sometimes because like when I film video, I film it. I don't do the research before. I don't do the editing. So I film in that moment. I learn about it in that moment. I put it out and then I'm kind of like done after that. So I'll have people come up to me and be like, Oh, this one video you did on, you know, um, who's Demi Lovato's ex creepy guy, some creepy guy. Um, he, a lot of people came up to me about that video and I was like, Oh yeah. Like I don't really remember anything I did in that. And I don't rewatch them. I've never rewatched a video. You're doing that in the moment. I was going to ask that because you have like a certain cadence with how mm -hmm. you even talk. Like, is that a script that you're reading when you're, yeah, no, I mean, I write a script for essentially the videos go, um, 10 to 30 seconds of like dramatic clips that we use within the video with dramatic music to kind of capture someone in with like all the drama. Then I, there's about a 40 second, 30 to 40 second moment where I give everyone they what they need to know if they were to click on that video. So if they clicked on my video and um, they want to learn about, you know, Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner's divorce, I give them everything they need in the first minute because I hate as a as someone who's watched YouTube forever. If you click on a video, then you hear someone sitting there subscribe to my channel, leave a comment below, make sure you share. Oh, hey guys, I'm doing really great today. But like just talking about themselves, it's like a new, a new viewer wants to click on something and get what they're clicking on again. Like it's like a product. Do you want to get what you, so, I mean, if they like me along the way, that's great. But um, that first bit is scripted because I usually sit down, film the video and I look at the content before because I've I've always done this process as far as my research, and then I've taught my employees to just mimic it. So they do a bunch of research, then you put them in a story order that's going to look good. So I sit there and I kind of read ahead sometimes, but sometimes I have an idea of like what's going on too, because I will send these video ideas to my team and be like, hey, make a video about this. I saw it on social media. So I have an idea of it. If I don't really know, I'll ask like, Olivia, give me like a 30 second just premise of like, what am I getting into if I don't know the person at all or um, the topic? But that's all just like off the bat. I mean, again, like to the product reward, like if I sit there and write a script, I am not great at writing. I don't remember the last time I've written anything longer than an email. And so that's a waste of time for me if I were to do that. And then plus like having to even filming sponsorships sometimes, like I've gotten good at like script reading, but if I had to memorize it for a whole video, I would just like trip myself up. So I kind of like just like reacting in that moment. <clears throat> and then I've also found myself like comfortable speaking off the bat. So only a little bit scripted because I'll film the video. And then at the end, I filmed that little intro because once I've gone through it, I'm like, oh, I know everything that's like hot in it. Then I could just like write it in a clever way. So then when someone clicks on it, if they watch two minutes of the video, they're, they they walk away feeling like they know what they've. Mm. feels less like a product, more like a service. I'll explain mm. what I mean. Like you talk about Oprah and the backlash and the island and I'm grappling with it myself and I'm watching your video and I'm like getting to experience 
the thought of how I would show up in the world if I had $3 billion and I was Oprah. Mm -hmm. So you get to grapple with these vicarious moments of experiencing celebrity through these dilemmas that you're posing them in or, or, or exposing them in. Yeah. And I guess like it's interesting looking at it as a service because I think that a lot of people view it as that as well. And then when they try to talk to me about like what I've done, I'm like, Oh yeah. Like, I mean, I can think back and pull a lot of information from these stories just from learning about them. But like, it is something I don't really look at it in that way. I guess that's also why sometimes I'm like really, um, surprised to have people come up to me or acknowledge my content or when they share it or it goes viral just because it doesn't feel that I guess necessarily important that's so vulnerable of you to share <laughs> and say it's it's crazy I'm shocked that you're saying that you came from the Department of Defense you told me mm -hmm. that you worked at the Department of Defense for years mm -hmm. before transitioning to do YouTube full-time mm -hmm. what's that like going from something that inherently has prestige it's like the most prestigious corporation yeah. to something that you're describing as potentially frivolous well I would say I mean I loved what I did there I did um statistical analysis for demographics and um, military readiness and anything that involved the military and the bases. I was running like building syntax and running numbers. So it was very statistical. I studied that in college. I loved it. I'm like one of the rare people. Well, I guess at the time that did exactly what they studied in school. So I went into that job and then um, it was, it was nice. I mean, there was like, you know, the, the balls and like the winter time and it was like night, it was a good job and impressive for the area. But um being there kind of like made me realize more of like how our government's a business and it was, it's a failing business. Essentially there's so many people who are hired there who are worthless. I was able to take like do my job and then two other principals jobs. They, I learned Salesforce. I learned all these things and it made me realize our, how, I mean, I'm glad I did it because our government is total. It's a mess. It's a terribly run business. That's why when I hear people who are running in politics talk about like how they've been a successful businessman, that's appealing to me because our government is just, um, a waste of money. And I, I have seen so many, I also did some contract work as well. So I would approve of these contracts of like $300,000 to go to these people who are just going to sit on their ass and do nothing because if you don't spend the budget money, then you don't get that money next year. So they just like are constantly throwing away our tax money. That's my little rant about the government. But then switching from that to this, it was different living in DC because why well, did the two, I was really making YouTube for about a year, more money from YouTube for a year before I left my government job. So they actually really overlapped. Um, like I was, I think at like when I left my government job, I was probably at 500,000 subscribers. So I had already built like a decent following and I was making a lot more. I mean, at one towards the end, I was making essentially my salary every month, but my parents were like, you have to stay. It's like good health care, And you never know if this is going to last forever. So then um, I had a time in, like DC where I was working that job and then also doing this and granted COVID was strong when I started really popping off on YouTube. So I didn't go out much, but I definitely felt a disconnect between like how people related to that career there. People didn't really like take YouTube seriously. And like when I left my government job, people were like, Oh, what are you doing? Like, this is like, makes no sense. Like nobody cares to talk about that stuff, especially out here because there's so many creatives, like people eat it up, but switching to that job or to my, you know, my YouTube job, I guess it was different. I mean, I had to create an LLC. Then I had, um, I got a manager like a month after and then WME, my talent agency reached out to me. It was like, Hey, we've got a big deal for you. So I immediately kind of started getting the hang of it. And I think that's because I went from like working nine to five to working like nine to five, then pretty much five to 12 every day because I was filming my videos and editing them myself, myself doing the research, filming multiple a day. If I could post two a day, I would post two. I just, it was like my social escape. I guess during COVID. So then switching out into it, doing it full time, it kind of like felt natural because I had such a working mentality that I was like, oh, now I have like a few hours in the day to go to a gym or do something else because I was not going to let the YouTube channel ever fail or not post a video. And even in the worst days that I have, I will not skip a day. Like I will work and post because the second you take a week off YouTube, you're done. There's your the algorithm will kill you off. How do you know that? Uh, from watching other people. Cause I haven't personally experienced, oh, actually, you know, I did get a strike on my channel and that was terrible. Lost like a lot in revenue and, you know, a week of not being able to post. That's a lot of like, you know, your subscribers, you go from making, getting 40,000 subscribers that month to 12,000 really quickly. So it's like a week can do a lot of damage. And so, yeah, I never, 
will skip out. And I think that a lot of creators out here, they don't have that nine to five mentality. So they're so lazy and they barely produce. And then they're making mostly TikToks, which are like so easy to make, no real money in it. But they're coming into the influencer space and kind of like soiling it because they're like not business. Well, they can be, but they're, you know, they're not like essentially <clears throat> running business like YouTube gives their creators the opportunity. And Facebook does too. Facebook, you can make a lot of money. Interesting. That's a lot. Sorry, that was a lot of. No, I, I, I need to learn from you. I need to be hustling more. I, I need to do videos. You said you have a lawyer friend. I need to link with her. But I need yeah. to do videos just about cases that I find interesting and not be so focused on having perfect production. Like I love this yeah. set, but I, I'm, I'm too, I have too much fidelity to like, Oh, it needs to sound perfect. And it need like, you're right. Your transitions are not crazy. It's 12 to 18 minutes of you. Just like, here's mm -hmm. a story about Britney Spears recent filing. Like, I need to be doing those kinds of things. Yeah. I, I have that passion. And, and that's something that I think like there's a few deterrents when it comes to being successful on YouTube. Like if you, I think like one reason I am successful is because I actually genuinely liked editing before. I've always liked editing. I've always liked making videos. Like even as a kid, I always made, had little video cameras and made videos. So like a lot of people are like, oh, I wish I could do that. But then they don't have any desire to learn the technology behind it, which technology, like you said, it is important to look great and to sound great, but that's also another deterrent too. I've had people who they like are so obsessed with how they look on camera or how the editing must be that they end up spending so long on something that never even makes it out there. I mean, I know I had terrible sound at the beginning of my videos, terrible camera um, quality. And now I film on my iPhone. So like I just hook it up to, with the webcam app and it's, these phones are just so great with their quality and their autofocus. So it's great, but there's people who are like obsessed with the it being perfect. And even for me, I guess I just don't have that in me because a lot of my videos too, like I like brushed my hair this morning and look decent, but like I'll wake up out of bed. My hair is a total mess and I'll just hop on there and film. Like, I don't care what these people see, how they look at me. And I think there's like, um, and there's like 900,000 hits on some of those. It's yeah. funny. We're like, there's like a fuzzing noise in the background. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're, they're older ones, like a 44 yeah. minute video of you just talking at the camera with like a few clips that are, or, you know, things that slide on. on. Yeah. I think that's a different mentality too. Like maybe you or other people look at, at a video as like, so many people are going to see this. This is going to be like great. Or like, I love this. I put so much energy into this and you want it to be perfect. And for me, the, some of those videos that have like a million views, I did not think anyone was going to see it. I thought maybe a few hundred would see it or a few thousand. Maybe I didn't really, I guess like I've never been driven by like how many views I'm getting because I genuinely love making the content and doing those stories that like, if it's not perfect, if it's perfect. If it's not, you know, performing that well, it just doesn't really matter to me because I loved doing it. And I had that love from a long time of making content. So if you don't have that and you don't have the natural ability to speak and look into a camera, because that's a big thing too. There's like a lot of people who wish they could do this, but then if you sit them in front of a camera with no human interaction, they can't do anything. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Yeah. So there's a few things I think are key components to <clears throat> doing well on there. And I do get really frustrated seeing creators who like want to have it perfect because I'm like, it doesn't have to be. You just need to post more and more because at least how I was rewarded was posting tons a day. And initially I didn't even edit my videos. I did live streams and I used a system called OBS and I would, it took me so long, but I would put in all the clips and all the pictures into OBS and I would go live and I would perfectly time things to go up on the screen or clips to play. And that's how I would produce four videos a day. When I first really started, I produced like so much because then I edit it. I would just get the stories together, put it into the system and then click it live there were some times where I stuttered and messed up and it was terrible, but there were so many of those videos. That's so cool. Yeah. And they're totally, they're horrible. I mean, I, I would click the intro to come on and stuff. Sometimes you would see me pop up for a second and then the intro would go and, but they built me my channel and they kind of funded my, um, like equipment. I mean, now I use my phone, but I did have a nice camera like these and a, a good setup when I lived in DC and I afforded that because I went live and on a live function, you can get tips on YouTube. I wish I would go live more option. I'm never going live because it's just a slippery slope. But why? Because you could easily mess up. And then people have like these, if they have like repeating questions, they will just keep asking them. And then other people be like, why is he not ask, like answering them? And then they'll just keep asking them and they just won't stop. And it's just like your whole stream is like asking personal information or questions about like, a, you know, a scandal that you don't want to talk about. So, but that I remember one time I got like $1,600 on a live stream 
I did, and that paid for everything. Actually, another YouTuber I was friends with, she's a terrible woman, whoever she is. I was so nice to her. Nobody liked her. I was so nice to her. I gave her tips. We talked about different stories. And then my friend who helped me actually learn the camera stuff, shout out to Dad's Challenge Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> he, um, but he helped me out back in the day and he did not like this woman. He despised her. And he somehow found out that she had an alternative channel where she edited her voice and she was making shit talking videos about me while she was my friend <laughs> and he unedited her voice. So then he sent me the files of him unediting it and it was her voice. So then I just like, at that time, my boyfriend was so like, did not understand the YouTube stuff. And I was like, I, I had like a panic attack. So I went live and was like exposing her and like for doing this. And that's when I got like $1,600 and it paid for all my camera setup. So yeah, thank you to, I can't remember her name. It was some like family channel thing. <laughs> I really started talking about family channels when I like popped off. Mm -hmm. When I was talking about these kids that are being like exploited on the internet by their parents, people loved it. That's okay. So let's put a flag in that. Something that I want to get to is also um, you. You said to me you're an open book. I've never had a guest actually say that to me. Mm. It's so they it's have really something re they don't want to talk about. <sighs> Definitely the lawyers oh, yeah. all have something they can't talk about or think oh, they're they, so they, annoying. I've had a few lawyers on and they're like, oh, yeah, I don't want to like speculate. I'm like, just <laughs> give me your opinion. <laughs> right. So it was really refreshing to hear that. But I'm curious, does presenting as queer and being openly gay, even in somewhere like Los Angeles where it's super friendly, mm. you still have to bump into a lot of marginalizing discourse and, and a lot of scrutiny. So does the fact that you have to navigate yourself through that make it a condition that you feel like you are, you, you kind of have to be an open book. It's kind of like hard to, pri you can't privatize this mm -hmm. intimate part of your life off, off the bat, which people yeah. want to like invade. Well, people can just look at me and uh, hear my voice and they're like, yeah, he's gay. So I don't really care. I mean, the gay things never really affected me. I would say like being a more conservative person and having a real world mentality opposed to these people who are so crazy woke in LA that they don't, you know, they, it's just, people are lost in this, weird idea of what like the queer community should be and it's discombobulated and to be honest i feel dis i feel slightly disconnected from that aspect of my life i guess like i don't ever talk about my sexuality really on camera i mean i was sometimes talking about my boyfriend and um i don't really advocate for queer things i actually have like oh my, i need to like work on it but my podcast guests lately have been like super conservative like lgbt people and i don't want to i don't ever want to align politically with anything because I just don't have that, like, in intelligence. I guess, like, almost, you know, the Israel and Palestine thing. People are like, why aren't you making a statement? Why aren't you making a statement? I was like, I know a lot, but I do not know anything about that, and I don't even want to go and put out a statement out if I'm not an expert. So um, I don't really, like, try to associate with the LGBT community or, like, do anything as far as content involving them. I guess, like, my life is, like, super gay with all my gay friends living in West Hollywood, so... I don't really feel a need to present that. And also I do appeal to more conservative people online. My audience is like half QAnon conservatives, right wings, and then half, you know, woke liberal, like survivor awareness type. So um, I think that if I were to push that, it would deter some people just in the same way that I feel deterred by my own community creating new flags and just rewriting everything. And it's just like, now I don't even know where I belong because there's so many different options. Mm. I don't know if that answered it. I feel like I'm the worst like gay, like creator. Cause I'm not like, I would, I definitely want to give back at some point. Cause I had a rough time like coming out and like, I mean, being on social media has been the easiest of it all. Like growing up in like a school, it was called cow pie high and having like my teachers bully me and having getting beat up and rocks thrown at me. I've had the worst things happen. So nowadays it just seems so cushy that sometimes I, I think that like I hear older gay people sometimes like resent how great it is now for like queer youth. And I feel like I'm kind of like that in a way too, that it's like, Oh, they, everyone has it so easy. I'm just like almost over it. Where's the struggle. There's no struggle anymore. You're asking like, is it difficult? It's really not. I feel like almost it has helped my career. That's very honest of you. I was going to ask, did, did it, well, it sounded like you had a harder time when you were younger. Did that give you the grit to be like, uh huh. F what other people say, I'm going to do my thing and be successful. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it definitely did. I mean, I think in a way too, it isolated me into my own world. And then I was able to create this world with my camera because I was posting videos in seventh grade throughout college. I've had probably like six or seven different channels and none of them really did well. I think my other, my 
besides my podcast channel, I had another channel, I had like 40K subscribers, but like really they weren't popping off. But I having that like disconnect and like having this world to go into with a dysfunctional family and then bullying at home, it definitely motivated me. And then I guess um, early on in my YouTube career, I never, I would like, these videos are, aren't, they're not online anymore, but I would like say that I, you know, YouTube's not a real job. Like I'm never going to be a full-time YouTuber. Like why would I be doing that? Cause I had no concept of the money you can make or the ability I, I had to like move forward. So, I mean, it did drive me, I think in my personal life to like work out and to like do well in my government job. But I never thought that I could ever do this ever as a career. I didn't think it was a real career. I just thought it was like a fun hobby that I've had. I knew some people made money from YouTube, but I didn't know how they did it. And then once I started making more and more, I realized really quickly that it's a mix of watch time and views. Subscribers don't count. People have like 3 million subscribers and they make like 5K a month. And so that's not important. That's why like some people are like, you should be at a million subscribers at this point. Like maybe, but you know, that's also not what I'm like reaching for. Mm. If I'm not getting views, that's the problem. Views and mm -hmm. watch time. Mm -hmm. Watch time too. Because if they, again, like people, they click on your video and you're sitting there talking about, oh, subscribe to my channel, click off. They're not going to go through any of those ads. So I try to, every story I put together, maybe it's not like, I don't do it by timeline of the story. I do it by like most intense woe factor in the beginning, something to really capture them and to show them like, well, wow, this is screwed up or I, I want to learn more about this. Um, and I think a lot of classic commentary channels, they go in like a timeline and they don't know how to, you know, shock someone in the beginning. They'll just go in like, I'm like, I'm sitting here taking notes, like <laughs> shock them in the beginning. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm so, I'm, I'm creating like C-SPAN content, like talking to lawyers about cases over like a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's like half of the stuff that I'm making, but I, I, I need to make it snappier. And like you're saying, focus on just the wow factor. This hook is interesting. Um, what, 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 what are you doing? Right? Like, what are you doing? You're, you're getting stadium level people to come watch your videos, mm -hmm. which is so cool, right? Like if you get 110,000, there isn't even, or maybe, you know, th a million, whatever, there's no, there isn't even a stadium that can hold that mm -hmm. amount of people. So you're essentially like, you're preaching gospel out there. Like, what are you trying to put out exactly? Are you trying mm -hmm. to expose to humiliate? Are you trying to expose so people can witness someone, experience someone more fully? Is it to punish the condemned, discipline the witnesses. What are we doing here? Yeah, I guess um, I was actually like talking to a journalist about this yesterday. So there's like the personal, I guess, motive. And then there's like the motive I'll tell everyone. And it's like, essentially there's um, a gap in the social media space for someone who's honest and truthful and who's going to expose some of the disgusting predators and raise up some of those survivors. I mean, there are so many child stars who've gone through countless stories of abuse or cases of abuse. And it's a sick cycle that I think needs to have light shined onto it. And the premise kind of applies to a lot of different stories. It could be Britney Spears's conservatorship. It could also be a family channel who's putting up their child or um, a creator who's abusing their <laughs> animal. There's a lot of like sick things going out there. And I felt that um, I could cover those and cover stories that are maybe less serious because I take more of a technical approach when it comes to trying to pull court documents and trying to really get down to the bottom of what this story means and what's important to show to people. So, so yeah, and I'm impressed with your level yeah. of research, but, and I don't mean to cut you off if you have no, a you're good, point that you're going to say, on a tangent, <laughs> no, no. So. Okay. I, I, I guess some, some of where it's coming from, like, let's talk about like the Oprah thing, like you're exposing Oprah, uh. but, but and and it was it was it's so enjoyable like i'm telling you i love your stuff like mm -hmm. so much of it is just like yes yes i give me more of this like i'm mm -hmm. i'm part of the people that gravitate towards this kind of thing um but some of it some of it just shows that she can get away with it meaning even though sloan hooks is gonna expose oprah she's still mm. she's fine so you yeah. know in, in a in a sense what you're doing is Showing no, she's so much more powerful than she's untouchable. You can't even imagine. And that's some, that's an unintended consequence potentially of your videos, I would say. Yeah. And you know, I think it's so interesting how you look at that. And that's, I think how a lot of people look at it because for me, I made the video because it had, it was highly requested and I still get shocked at celebrities who cease and desist me or who try to message me like Sean Kingston was trying to message me these people because it is just like my little video and it's not going to affect them. Even like I was at Soho House and Drake Bell, like 
uh, no, not Drake Bell. It was um, Mike Milos from the band Rye came out to me and like started like going off on me. And it's like, I cannot, I still don't think that there's like, it's not that important. It's just a little YouTube video. Like it's not like, yeah, a few hundred thousand views. That's nothing. No, that, many people that's are out not there. true. But I'm just like, it does to me, there's nothing to, for Oprah. Like, I don't feel like I'm doing anything to Oprah. Like if, and if I am, that's true. Like if I were to meet another celebrity, yeah, like I don't, like I would be weird. Like I, <laughs> that's why I don't want to have too much bad blood in the industry. Cause I don't really look at it that serious. Like if I were to like see someone who I've made a video about, um, like Jimmy Kimmel and like in public, I'd be like totally nice to him and normal. It's like, it's just work. It's just that's what happens. That's the media. Like it's it's been like this forever. You put out stories. It's you know sometimes it trashes them. Sometimes it could look good, and then you move on. I just I feel like like I don't feel like an advocate or like an activist in some way with my content. I'm making the content because people are requesting it because people want to see it. So then I create the product. I put it out there. And it's done. And I would hope that anyone I talk about, like if they had a real problem with it, like the lawyers can deal with it, or they can reach out to me, or we could figure it out. But I mean, it's just a video. Like it's keeping them relevant. For some of these people, some other creators that like I've talked about are, you know, celebrities. It's like some people don't even know who they are. And then I bring them to a new audience. Like they should be thinking me in a way. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't look at it as like a impactful, like, oh, I want to stop Oprah. Uh, I think maybe for the Free Britney movement, it was a little bit different. I was a lot more involved with it personally and like actually a part of a movement. But other than that, I, that's why I was saying earlier, I like filmed the video. I, I, and then I check in, check out. And I'm kind of like. Whatever happens, happens. I hope the person doesn't hate me because even like Mike, the situation, I know he hates me. And it's like, oh, I want to have him on my podcast at some point. But now we've got bad blood because he took my video too serious. Like, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, that's not for you to say. I guess so. Yeah. Because <laughs> you have a big fan base. It's not just a little video. I, I guess like I've gotten numb to that because I did have at points where it did affect me and my emotions, like in my personal life and gave me depression when I did actually hurt someone through my videos. So I can understand how people sometimes get hurt, but that was a little bit more towards the time where I did like, uh, I guess more scandalous exposés as far as like they weren't really publicized. Nowadays, like my videos, like there's tons of articles about them. They, like they're everywhere. So like me putting my video together, it's like go to the articles and tell them to go remove it. Why is my video the problem when I'm just like re just reiterating what people have said, just putting it in a catchy way with some clips and, you know, getting views on it. So I, I still like feel like it's, I mean, I guess it's up to that person, whether it's a big deal or not. And I can tell sometimes too, when people aren't just like, they're just super emotional or they can't handle people talking about them. And that's never been me. Like if people make videos about me and people have, I just, I'm not bothered. Mm -hmm. I think because I also feel very disconnected from my job that it's not about me really. It's not about my personal life. People can't really say anything about who I am through me just like speaking on the news. Mm. The fact that you have lawyers that you're dealing with sometimes, what was like the hottest legal controversy you got into because of an expose you did? Mm, probably Bob Saget. Yeah, because that... The late great. Yeah, he went from cease and desist to cease to exist. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he was super mad at this video that went viral, got like a million views in a day. And that was the first time I truly felt like I went viral because it wasn't just like on YouTube. I was like going on TikTok and there were like plenty of people like talking about like, did you know Bob Saget's such a creep? Blah blah. It's like I started this whole wave of people just hating on him, all from like my video that went viral. And um, he was super threatening. He used Andrew Brittler, and they were just like, you have to take it down. Blah blah blah. We're gonna get the Olsen twins lawyer involved, which I'm more scared of the Olsen twins because they have real money. <laughs> like Bob Saget, yeah, he's got money, but he's still like, you know, he was doing shows in his fifties or you know, still doing that type of stuff. So. Um, I was super scared at first and I did remove the video. I ended up putting the video back up once he died and making more videos. Um, but that one was really intense because I had no legal representation. So I was just going back and forth with them. And actually there was a lawyer <laughs> in the free Britney movement I met. So he was helping me like kind of like formulate my responses, but I was complicit in the beginning for the first year and a half of like when people would reach out. And then since then I've gone to the point where I like later on will either talk about it or just re-release the video. Like Liz Gillis sent me a cease and desist and it was so sad. It was like a paragraph long and I took down the video cause I was scared. She's like, you got 24 hours. So I was like, okay, well I'm going to wait till the 24th hour cause I'm going to get all the views I can cause this video is doing well. 
But then I ended up taking it down. And then a year later from that date, I made a video of the cease and desist letter and told, kind of told the story, but I was like, oh, did you know? I made the title like Liz Gillis threatened to sue me. And it was like a year after that letter came to me. So sometimes I like take those things from the past and I'll like bring them back to life and be like, oh, like here's some more content. Like if someone's lawyer reaches out to me, it like nine times out of 10 will end up in a YouTube video oh or if any celebrity does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More content. More content. Yeah. Everything is content. Yeah, I guess so. Mm -hmm. So what are your goals for the channel and how do you, how do you like make sure that you're going to keep up the growth? Yeah, that's, um, I think that's hard sometimes. Like, well, I keep just listening to the people and posting videos that they want to talk about. And thankfully pop culture, there's so much content. I've got lists and lists of things to talk about. So I'm really like focused on just keeping that going and, you know, hitting my million and uh, just producing kind of the same content on there. I don't really see much change coming from that. I think personally in my career right now, I'm looking for growth in other ways. So with the podcast, like focusing on that, I, I'm working with the publicist to try to get like some more guests on because it's such a struggle. And then my Snapchat show and then working with merchandise and uh, getting on the red carpet and doing some interviews for like People Magazine or ET or things like that is kind of where I'm headed because... Ultimately, I know YouTube isn't going to last forever, so I want to make sure I get myself everywhere so I can make some type of name for myself so that whenever YouTube does, like, you know, fail or if I fail or if the site fails or anything, um, I'll have I'll just graduate into mainstream or do something in entertainment. Mm -hmm. well, you said you got a strike once on YouTube and that yeah. took you down. I learned that if someone someone could strike a YouTube channel and then extract the revenue from that video. Mm -hmm. There's all these different intricacies behind strikes and things like that. Like how do you make sure you don't get struck? The stuff you're talking about is so contentious. Yeah. You're pulling from other sources. Like luckily I have, well, I mean, I was going to say my friends at YouTube, they're not really great friends. They don't help me that much, but um, that video actually what's interesting. Well, I get a lot of, there's two different types of strikes. You can get like a policy strike or you can get a copyright strike. Scooter Braun needs to stop sending me copyright strikes before I actually build a case against him because he's wrongfully using the copyright act because I have fair use using his picture and talking about him. And actually in the two videos that he's striked me on, I blurred his picture in every photo. I had my editor blur every one of his photos because he cannot copyright that. He still keeps copywriting me and YouTube is telling him, no, you can't do that. And then he's sending his legal team and sending YouTube threats that he's going to sue YouTube. So if they don't take down my video for copyright, he's going to sue YouTube. So that is disturbing. And I'm trying to figure out my way around that. I had to remove all my Scooter Braun videos just because if he were to keep striking them, I could end up in trouble. Luckily, a copyright strike isn't that big of a deal. Policy strike is, I've had two of those, one on my podcast channel, one on my main channel. On my main channel is for a video that never went public. And I actually uploaded that video 10 times because like you said, I talk about difficult topics. I've found ways to make sure they're monetized because I won't post a yellow video, like never. I'll wait, if it's like a hot news topic and it's yellow, I will wait a week if I have to until it's green to post it because posting a yellow video will make you no money. There's no point in even creating the video in the first place. Yellow so, meaning demonetized, like the little money symbol by the thing. So, um, yeah, I had a video that I uploaded 10 times. It kept getting demonetized because it had Drew Barrymore making out with a 15 year old. Oh, no, not Drew Barrymore. Who was that? It was uh, <laughs> not me setting up Drew Barrymore. It was um, <laughs> the she was dating Ashton Kutcher, I think, at some point. Demi Moore. Demi Moore. Yes. Demi Moore was making out with a 15 year old and they said it was child porn, even though I blurred it and I put a censored thing over it. Um, uploaded it 10 times. It got demonetized probably like seven times, got human reviewed and approved twice. And then once it got demonetized. And even though it wasn't ever public, I got a strike for it because they said I was putting out child porn. And it's frustrating because I had two of those videos, the same exact video file get approved for human review or by human review for monetization. So how are you going to like the same file, give me a strike on it when these other ones are approved. And of course, I don't bring that up to YouTube because what YouTube would do from what I've learned is they'll say, they'll say, oh, oh, like those are monetized. Let's go back and then we'll strike those too. And then you'll have three strikes and you're out. So I had to take the L on that video and it never went public. But getting around the rules, I mean, censoring, blurring, and then I upload it multiple times with fake titles and fake thumbnails until there's a stupid human review person who just approves it for monetization and doesn't care. And then it's 
Then I could put all the ads. I could put the word rape in the title if it's approved. You can put anything in the title. They won't take it down after the fact? Uh, nope, unless they're like um, like pinned somehow. Like So if they, it got a, like, a lot of reports from viewers mm -hmm. or if someone like reached out to YouTube. But other than that, no, they like the word abused is very demonetized. And I have a few videos with the title abused because I had someone review it with a fake title and they were probably <laughs> lazy, you know, sitting there with their chips in a Google office. And they're like, oh, sure, this is fine. Because the the system reviews it at first, and then if it's demonetized, you send it to a human to review it. Sometimes that human is lazy, and they just approve <laughs> it. Or sometimes I'm like, I'm thinking there's someone there on my side who's like helping me out. So mm -hmm. maybe. So, what are those some celebrity stories that did stick with you? I was talking about the Sheehan expose that you did. It was really cool. Like that's John Oliver level reporting right there. Yeah. Um, but what are some of the stuff that you have put out that did stick with you that you're like, okay, I'm glad I drilled down on that. That was a crazy story. Hmm. I mean, there's some videos that I've talked about and they did really well. So I think that like sticks out to me like money wise. Cause I'm like, Oh, like this one paid for my rent for like three months. <laughs> um, what was the most you made on a video? Uh, I think I haven't looked in a while. Maybe like 20,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was like a lot too. Like usually every video makes like two to three K. So 20,000 was like a lot. And I was like, I think my most viewed video about uh, Dan Schneider. Um, I don't know who that is, but, and you're pumping these out from like a webcam, your iPhone. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And I'm used to, I mean, sometimes even if a story is hot and I'm like, I need to get this out right now, I'll edit it myself and just like throw it up. And it would just like, I did little to no editing. I'll just put a picture over a few cuts and then it would have like 300,000 views that day. I did one about Ariana recently that did that. But I mean, I think like the videos that stick out to me are the ones that I, I guess I didn't think would do well. And then they did do well. Like my Jared from Subway video, that was, uh, it did really great. And I was like surprised because that was the first time I was really tapping into a story that's like 10 years old, but it's disgusting. And um, it kind of opened my eyes to other topics I could talk about that like people my age or younger than me will not know or um, would be interested in like I did one about Shirley Temple that one has like 900,000 views it's like I didn't know who Shirley Temple was and then learning what she'd gone through it's like horrific so I love when I can talk about those are like Elmo I did one about Barney I did like <laughs> all these like weird characters and those ones really stick with me because I was like oh I didn't really believe in them and then they like popped off so and like my Woody Allen stuff has done really great it's like who would have thought that like you know everyone my my one of my good friends a lot of my colleagues too in the commentary they talk about like really current topics or they talk about other youtubers or people in the sphere so i've kind of found my niche and i think i've done well with a larger demographic by talking about the older stories talking about elvis and then um also keeping up with the current news that i think that they would be receptive of mm -hmm. it's so cool to hear the numbers and the mindset I'm curious what your opinions are on a couple of celebrity things. Mm -hmm. uh, the rust Alec Baldwin shooting. Mm. Like what, what is, what does that mean to you? Oh, he's a monster. He's an absolute monster. I've made a few videos about him. I mean, the voicemail he left to his daughter, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that story, I wish like, uh, it's so annoying because like the QAnon people like took it and like made it into this thing where that girl was supposedly creating like a human or child trafficking, like documentary that one, the victim, Helena, I believe Helena Hutchins. Yeah. And um, so that story, I mean, I think he's absolute trash. And I mean, when it comes to Alec Baldwin, like he gives me like sell your soul vibes. Like I think he's just the worst type of person out there. Him along with his wife, Hilaria, who lies about her ethnicity and her background. They're just like sick people. And he's clearly mentally ill. So I wouldn't be surprised if he did do some like shit like that or if it was some, I don't know, weird, I like, am, I'm in between like reporting on like real news and pulling the documents and those things. And then also conspiracy because part of me, I don't express this as much, but I do feel like Hollywood is like really evil. And, um, I think that like they could have like taken her out if she was some threat or had some documentary piece, but you know, the website says that that's false news. Right. Either way, I think he's terrible and his <laughs> wife is absolutely horrible. And I think even their um, Justin Bieber's wife, she's not great either. What's her name? Haley. Haley. Oh, God, she's tragic. All the racist tweets that she's done before. Mm. Yeah, it's just like, like I, I, that's one thing too. I think uh, I've never like. Is she, oh, she's a Baldwin. I yeah. I never even put that together. Yeah, she, her uncle's um, Alec, 
house. Got it. Yeah. So um, she's terrible too. And I just can't imagine like some, like when I hear these stories about Alex Baldwin being a terrible person or fighting with people on the streets of New York, I just can't understand how someone does that. Like, and even the racist stuff, like I've never said a like racist thing. I mean, you know, everyone's a little racist, but like I've never like used the N word or things like that. And like where I grew up, like you would never do that. Like, what are you like talking about? So to see people like, you know, Haley Baldwin coming up and like tweeting all these things. And I just think they're an absolute trash family. Mm-hmm. It kind of reminds me of like Emma Roberts too. Like now that she's a Nepo like star, I think she's just like treats everyone like absolute garbage. Mm-hmm. She's not even a great actress. Mm. I'm not so familiar with her, but I am familiar with the Kardashians and uh-huh. I it's, it's tough. Like you, you say that Hollywood is evil and what isn't evil? I mean, every, every industry is like a little bit evil. You can go into mm-hmm. medicine, law. I'm sure. Even this is essentially because it's self worship. We think that we're worthy enough to like be on camera and to be talking. Mm-hmm. And I think that like everything's kind of evil. It's just different degrees. Mm-hmm. Kardashians are definitely like a higher degree. But they also profess family values. They have each other's backs. Mm-hmm. They have each other's hearts. Like they're they they're still like relevant and sticking with each other for so many decades. That's got to be worth something. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I guess I have a different perspective because like the, in the last week I've posted a video about how Courtney and Kim are fighting and they've been in a feud and they've been having a lot of issues and then how Kim is constantly hanging out with Tristan who's Chloe's ex partner who embarrassed her so many different times. So I think that they are like a typical family. I mean, don't get me wrong there, but I do think morality is missing and seeing what they've done to the guy that created Kimojis and how he's homeless on the street, making content, like trying to get his life back because Kim has threatened to sue him so much. And even uh, connected with the mayor of Malibu recently because Courtney lied on these permits and there's someone in the Malibu office, I guess like the, you know, the city office who's working with the Kardashians and like approving these things that should not be approved of. So, I mean, I, it's not like they're like absolutely evil, but they're, um, maybe they are, but they're definitely those type of people who like leverage their fame and their money to get what they want and to present what they want to. I mean, I think the whole Hulu show has been a way for them to try to rewrite their branding and to come off more loving because in the E like series, it was terrible. They were fighting all the time, getting violent with each other. So it's all scripted, but that's, that's the thing. Like you said, this is, this is, this has some evil trace to it, but w- what you're doing is also you you contribute to the hype, to mm-hmm. the, to the dissonance of like, these people should be famous. Look, I'm going to talk about them. And yeah. there's, this, this is so important to talk about. And like, you're contributing to that in a way. Yeah. I guess I, I think it's important. Some are important. Some aren't. Some of it's just like, I think, um, what are some of the important ones? Important ones, I would say, like, working on... So Dan Schneider, you don't know who that is, but he created, like, Drake and Josh and um, um all that and... Um, like Nickelodeon iCarly, shows? yeah. He did all those, and he was a terrible guy, and so many people have been scared from talking about him, so my most viewed video is about him, and since then I've connected with other child stars who have worked with him, and I've done interviews, and I think that was really important because um a lot of news... Uh, outlets were working on stories and reaching out. So one of my good friends, Alexa was on Zoe 101 with him and she had multiple outlets like reach out and try to do stories over the years. And then they all ended up pulling them. And then you'll see like a piece in, you know, New York times about like Dan Schneider, like loves uh, pizza with his dog and his wife, his (laughs) wife is hungry girl. Who is a, um, she's like a, a cook, a recipe book, uh, person. She's created a cartoon of that. But I think that was really important. And then I think some of the least important ones are like about like Ariana Grande, like cheating on her, you know, husband and like. So why do that? You know, and Ariana could uh, probably cheat on her husband. Yeah. I, I don't really know the situation there, but. I guess. Um, so it also, depend- also like and you're kind of tasting this now, like your life is is getting more and more different from the average person's life. And mm-hmm. it just gets more different and more and less relatable. And like mm-hmm. in order to bring nuance to the conversation, you'd really have to have Ariana be here and be like, no. And she was obviously never want to yeah. get into that, but there's, there's, I, that's what I'm, I think that there's a way that like you, you could understand like even the worst of these people, if you were in their shoes. Oh you know? yeah. And is there room for repentance in your, in your worldview? Like, yeah, I guess I don't th- take a lot of it that serious. So like when I don't think anyone's ever canceled, like I don't like cancel culture. I don't believe in that. Um, I mean, I think people like R. Kelly, you know, it's a different situation. But um, as far as like that content, I've always grown up watching YouTube and absorbing the content. 
So I think that there's value to me personally by making it because I am reaching people, even though sometimes it's hard for me to grasp my mind around it. I am reaching people and I'm like, people love every day to like look at my videos and getting their daily de- dose of Sloan. And even though it's not necessarily that important content, I mean, covering like the really intense stuff all the time, that's draining. Like, And I, even me as disconnected I as I am, it's like, People sometimes tell me, like, why don't you talk about something that's a little bit more positive? And it's like, unfortunately, that's kind of the more positive stuff. Like, talking about the Ariana Grande cheating thing. Like, people are kind of, like, gagged over it. And it's just, like, not that serious, but it's still news and gossip. So I think I find the value in just actually putting out the content so those people who do wake up every morning to watch my videos and get ready or on their drive, they can, like, have it available. So it doesn't have to, like, be the most impactful social movement. Why do you think people including myself, are so interested in this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, I haven't clicked on the Ariana Grande cheating. I probably <sighs> never will, but like, yeah, but there are, and, and like I said, there's certainly like the, the Sheehan one. That's, that's beautiful. That's like, that's so important. I wonder which one you saw. I did too. I saw the more, the more recent one Yeah, where you're just exposing how they're exploiting their workers and hiding it. And yeah, it's just tragic. And anytime you bring awareness to like what we buy, what we wear, how we contribute, everything's touching each other, the globalism of it all. I think that that was a really beautiful piece of journalism. Yeah. And like, it's fun to watch you do that. It's almost like indiscriminate. Like sometimes it's like, I'm going to go all in on Kim Kardashian Mm -hmm. taking this picture. And then sometimes it's like, no, we're going to take down this like world order entity that has this global demonization. And I think those are very different. Like, Oprah should have helped the island people. Like she has all the money, but does she have to? Like, do you want to live in a world where like you get to that level and no, now you're obligated. And th- this is this is the way of the world. Like we can just make our demands and you have to cower to them in a way. And I mean, you know, do, do, does everyone have to save the world when they have a billion dollars? Like, um, but. Yeah, I think I would like to do more of the Shein pieces. Like if I had, it's just those are more difficult as far as research and, and like finding a company there is a little bit more risk in like being held liable. I mean, I've had a friend who was sued for like $5 million for making this video about a makeup company. And it's just like, it's a little bit more risky, but I definitely like see like my YouTube channel kind of continue where we're at, but I want to graduate in different ways and do things that are a little bit more um, deeper pieces or more research. And even I have a a series I'm going to do called cease and desist with Sloan, where I'm going through all my legal documents with, um, or my threats per episode. Like we'll have a Bob Saget episode, Drake Bell episode, these different episodes for each person and have my friend go through it all with me and see how these people use tactics to try to silence people like me. And I think I, I have like desire to create more off kind of one-off pieces like that. That'll be like a 10 episode series. And then once I get through my current like podcast contract, why not have it it. all on one channel? Because right now my, algorithm is like the revenue is great the view the the like each video is about like you know 10 to 30 minutes long and it's perfect if i were to go and throw an hour long video on there it will disrupt the algorithm and like that's why like my podcast for example they were gonna like give me a big like sign on bonus if i put it on my main channel and i was like no i'd rather not take that money because i can foresee that money being lost in ad revenue if i threw an hour-long interview up onto my main channel where people don't want to watch that i can't post anything else within 24 hours and why can't you post anything else within- just like they they would require that like the podcast and the brands and stuff they'd be like oh you can't post anything else within like 24 hours because they think it would like deter from that video. You keep saying the algorithm, like what do you mean by that? You, you see that, okay, people tune in for 15 minutes. So I don't want to put an hour video. Like what, what Mm. about the algorithm is informing your decision there? Oh, the algorithm is, um, so if you're looking at, there's a few different aspects in your analytics, you could look at people who are not subscribed. And if you look at that number, a lot of people on YouTube, they're like, oh, I see that 50% of you guys aren't subscribed. Like, make sure you subscribe. That's actually kind of a good sign because you want, that's like new reach, essentially, is how I take it. And then I have other channels that I log into. And um, a lot of people will comment and say, like, oh, I was recommended this. Like, And I think there's a part in the analytics where you could see if it's, like, how much of your videos are being viewed by recommendations. And YouTube's recommending me a ton. So that's why I have this, like, relationship with the platform where I'm, like, Constantly going to give them what they want because they are pushing it out to new people. So cool. Yeah. It's really, really cool. Any closing thoughts? Anything that you feel is misunderstood about what you do? Um, I would say, well, one thing my boyfriend always likes to joke about is that when I meet people, 
I'm always like, oh, do you have like a real job or do you have like a job like I do? And sometimes I joke about it not being a real job because I do understand like what you said, like my life is becoming less and less relatable. Like as I'm making more money and getting more into this world, but it is a real job and there's so much to it that I'm working all the time and creator burnout is real, especially when you're really in it. Like I am with like, like today I've got my Snapchat show I need to film. I've got another two hour podcast I need to do. I've got a video I'm about to post after this. Like there's so, I've got a brand. I just like does sponsorship and I said the company name wrong. Like there's so many different things that are constantly going on. And even though it seems like fun and like lighthearted, it is a difficult job and not everyone could do it, especially if you can't disconnect your own personal self from that. I mean, sit like there's some people who sit around and read comments and you have to learn different skills to disassociate so that you can prevail. So it is a hard job, but it's the most rewarding job I could ask for. And I feel like and at this age, everyone's looking for their calling. And this is exactly what I want to be doing. And it's going to change in different ways. But I think I'll always be with a mic and maybe on camera, maybe behind camera. But. And you have no aspirations to get any political inclinations out there because it's so unique or maybe it's not and i'm just not in the zeitgeist but like to be to be gay and to be very conservative and like uh, anti-woke in a way yeah uh there's like a good amount of people out there it's just it will it turns off people too easily so for now i don't want to mess into that realm but i think maybe i mean i'm 28 now i could see in 10 years like stepping more into that space or even after i buy this property in west hollywood i'm going to try to run for city council really so, yeah because i want to get in there because i feel like i know how to run things and like i i don't know i can i say things that people are sometimes scared to say and that's also a big part of my channel and why i get threats and um i just don't have that in me to back way or to that's great how, how you how do you have that time that's amazing that you're gonna try yeah. and do that well i mean you know it's yeah it's gonna be a lot but it should be good i mean it's not too and it's also something that i've always wanted to do because i do like giving back to the community and like when i was living in florida I was like, that's how I filled a lot of my free time because moving out here has put me to work so much more work than I've ever had before. So I'll make the time for it. And plus I've got a great team and I think that's a big part of like succeeding on here as well. Because Do you, do you have a, a, six, um, a success routine? Like you wake up at like six, work out mm. for two hours. I mean, obviously you're working out. Yeah. Like, do you have a, is it a routine based thing? No, actually I like, I'm kind of against routines. I just don't have any routine. Like nothing, like my eating is not routine. My working out is different times, usually about two hours a day though. And that's kind of like my, with a lot of what I do, I don't have human interactions. So that's kind of like my way to get out and like, it's so ironic, and, right? Like you're being blasted out to a million people a day yeah. and you, you feel starved for that human interaction. Element. Yeah. Just like to disconnect and to like, I mean, going to the office back at the DOD, like I would, I mean, I didn't want to talk to these people, but I was talking to someone and sometimes with YouTube, especially when I was moving around in Florida, I just like would have no one to talk to. So just be sitting there all day. And even though like, I guess some people can find the social fulfillment from like comments and stuff. I just don't read comments because also the comments aren't applicable to me a lot of the time. So they're about the story. And like I said, I film a video, I post it and I'm kind of like disconnected. So I have nothing to add. That isn't where you get your ideas from though. You said that no. you, some of them are resp responsible. Like people were asking for the Oprah video or yeah. something. So where are you getting that from then? Uh, there's, probably like two or three different places email i've got like 19,000 unread emails so i have like two of my my employees they help manage that and pull ideas sometimes on instagram i'll like ask in the story swipe up and i always save those things so that's another place and then third i have a moderator that i hired to moderate all my comments i don't actually even know what she does she just like kind of like offered it like a year ago and i was like sure um because there was people like creating fake sloan profiles and trying to get them to like telegram and kick them so they can like or, like messaging apps so they could like scam them so she was helping clean up that mess and she also pulls a bunch of video ideas so i've got like even on my phone right now i haven't replied to her in days i feel so bad but she just sends me screenshots every day of people sending all their video ideas and then i'll take those screenshots and send it to my other two employees and then they will create the videos and you were doing all this yourself for like a year or two yeah yeah and it was and i mean it would it took hours like now the amount of time i spend on one video is about for, for filming, it's usually about 10 minutes longer than what the actual video is. So if the video is 20 minutes long, it probably took me 30 minutes to film. So And then you're just cutting a little bit of the fat? Uh-huh. I'm just like, I'm like, I put the, we create an MP4 file and then we put all the receipts together. So I project it on the screen. So they don't even have to drag and drop these articles or anything. They're already in the original MP4 
filming of it because I have two screens when I film my main screen and then my little screen where I'm in the corner and it's just projecting what's on my screen. So I'm just reading off like what it is. And then it's also all the crucial information for the video all in one. So, um, that's really cool. What, how, what software do you use for that? I use OBS OBS and then final cut pro. Mm -hmm. And then, so then I, yeah, I spend that amount of time and then I create, I'm very particular about my thumbnails and titles. So for, each video, I usually spend about 40 minutes total compared to when I used to have to edit it, add like an hour or two hours onto it. So still, that's lightning fast. Yeah. So I can film like I have big filming days. Like tomorrow will probably be like six videos I'll film and just like knock it out and get it done in like four hours. Wow. Yeah. Really cool. Thanks for making time to do this. This yeah. was really fun. Thanks for having me on. It's like good PR training. I feel like it helps. So <laughs> I have so much to to learn from you. The the prolificness, like I said, and the, the grind is so real. Like mm -hmm. I have a friend that's a really successful podcaster, and he's one of the most stressed out people I know. And like he has to make it look effortless, like at least yeah. his public persona. And really, he's just like losing his mind all the time, like with just you know ad revenue pressure and strikes and comments and Ugh, yeah, it's, it's just a lot. It's just so much, and you know. So it's really cool that you're you're out there fighting the good fight. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. I'm gonna do it as long as I can. Why do you keep saying that? You, it seems like you you feel like there's a sunset on YouTube. Yeah, I think everyone kind of has it. But I mean, what luckily, do you mean? Just like in in the zeitgeist out there, it's percolating that YouTube's not the future, or? Oh uh, no, I think YouTube will always be around. I just think I've seen a lot of creators who are just not relevant anymore. And I'm very like cut and dry. Like if you're not relevant, you're not relevant. Like it's like even some people will be like, oh, make a video about this, or like someone in my gym will be like, do this. And I'm like, that's no one's searching that. I'm not gonna be talking about that on my channel. Like so, just in the real world, I know that it doesn't last forever. Even though I would like it to, and I think that I am, I've got a niche where it's not dependent on my life. It's just dependent on stories, and they can be old, they can be new. So maybe it will last. But I also think that I just, for me personally, I want some more. I want more out of it. So. I don't think it will always last for me because hopefully one day I'll have a show mm. or be t at a network or something along those lines. Okay, so wait. So while I have you, I, I need to get more prolific. I've been saying that like 10 times here. What what would be like five video ideas off the top of your head that, I mean, maybe you don't want to put me in competition with your friend that's also a lawyer who's an Oh, influencer. no, you're fine. Yeah, so what would you what would you say like, because you, you said like things people, people wouldn't want to search. Like sometimes I do podcast with like someone that fought a legal battle for 10 years or whatever. And like, no one cares about it. Like I interviewed this woman about like homeless crisis and like she was really doing the work and no one, no one really seemed to care much about it. It could be because my titles are off thumbnails. There's so many different factors, but I do think it's about the content underneath. Like, what do you think I should do? Um, that I, I, I can pump out the content as fast as, as, uh, you are. So are they all interviews, right? They all are interviews, but I'm, I'm down to start just talking at the camera. Well, there's, I would say if you want to, as I guess my mind goes to pop culture. So like, I feel like if you can connect with the lawyers who have represented cases, as far as like reality stars or real housewives, like those real housewives are constantly in trouble. Like something where the, you need to have your guest is not going to grab the attention. Like no one, no one know, like knows the lawyer, but they know who they're representing. So for me, it's like if the person or the topic is not being Googled, like if I made a video about, I, I made a video recently about a rapper named Blueface and I don't think he's that popular. So I almost titled it rapper. <laughs> this is the worst like rapper ever or like something along those lines. Right, Blueface is a bad father. Yeah. Like, yeah. Title. Yeah. So I almost did like this rapper is a terrible father instead because I'm like, oh, is Blueface going to deter people? So you need something that's going to come off relatable and people relate to reality TV a lot. And I think when you... When there are cases like, I mean, the Amber Heard Johnny Depp stuff was super hot. I don't know if you talked about that with people, but just like any topics that you can have like a lawyer friend or someone to bounce like ideas on. Um, I know like Emily D. Baker, she was making like $200,000 a month in like ad revenue just from covering that case. And it's insane the amount of money that is in the legal world. It is there, but she's been able to take it and, you know, make it very pop culture esque. And I think that Emily D. Baker, she's uh -huh. a creator I need to check out. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen her? No. Oh, she's and she's got a great branding, law nerds, and she's an excellent like uh, legal YouTuber, and she does live streams mostly. So that's a lot of ad revenue she gets from that. But I think making something, you have to always think about. Um, is it SEO, search engine? Yeah, SEO. Every time you like go into a project, so even like talking to someone who you may think like has a boring story, if you could find something that would be a search and like you know show up on a search engine then mm -hmm. try to leverage that right on well thank you so much this was really fun mm -hmm. thanks sloan wish thank you the you. best of luck with your channel yeah bye guys okay
I didn't imitate you once. I wanted to at least say once, let's get into it. Yeah. I didn't do it. We should do that. Let's get into it. Jason Ingberg? Yeah. Ingberg? Yeah. Today we're on the Jason Ingberg podcast. So let's get into it. I don't know. If- <laughs> I love how you do it in one take. You do everything in one take, right? Yeah, I try to. It's Sometimes crazy. I mess up. And actually, I do a lot of like, my editors will, if I mess up midway, I'll go back and just say the 